Welcome to R and SAS Programming, Stat 40, Lecture 11. Today we're going to talk about R functions. Um, we're going to talk about defining and calling functions, uh, what's called symbol binding and scoping rules, so a little more uh, detailed on the uh, enclosure environments and things of that nature. Um, defining and calling what are called infix functions, so just a different way of, of creating functions. Um, and then applying uh, functions repeatedly using something called functionals. So sort of looping through uh, a data structure and applying a function several times in a very efficient way uh, with these, uh, these R functionals that are available to us. Okay, defining and calling functions. Um, in R, functions are just another class of object. Um, so if you use the class function to find out, you know, what is a uh, what is an object, uh, and we've seen that before, and we can see it returns data frame or vector, and we we know we have character vector, numeric vectors, uh, and all those different types of vectors. But um, if we ran that on a function, it's just a named uh, object itself. It's just of class function. Um, so in a lot of ways, it's like any other R function. And then, obviously, in some ways, it's 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 kind of special in a way, but it's just another object, um, or I should say, our object. Um, so sometimes these are called custom or user-defined functions, uh, and we create those with what's called what's called the function directive. Take a look at some examples here in a little bit of that. Um, Parts of the function directive are the function name. So just like other objects in R, we give it a name. Um, then we have to write the function directive, and then we have to write basically what we want to do inside the function. Um, what, you know, we're we're going to take in a set of potentially take in a set of parameters, uh, sometimes called arguments. So you'll hear me say parameters and arguments interchangeably. Um, and then we just write code that we want to execute when those arguments or parameters are are passed into the function for execution. Uh, so the general syntax here, uh, you'd replace everything between these uh, angled brackets. So here I have new function, so this would be your function name. This is the function directive that has a list of arguments that you would like to take into uh, um, the function to execute, and then some statements here. Um, and we can write this on multiple lines the same way, but we use these curly brackets, and then we can put multiple lines here. Um, obviously we could also put multiple lines here um, using a semicolon, um, but it would get pretty pretty ugly pretty fast. So most common way is to use these curly brackets here and here. And I put the curly bracket on the same line as the name here so it's pretty clear to see where it starts and stops. So this is a pretty common way of, of writing this. So again, just using the assignment operator, we're just naming an object. That's all we're doing. We're just naming an object. Um, here are some examples um, that I worked through. Um, let's say we have a function we're calling it squarer, um, and it's the it takes and it squares anything you give it. <laughs> so there's obviously already easier ways to do this in R, um, but you know, for sake of demonstration, we're going to make a uh, a function here. So um, squarer is what we're going to name it. Uh, then we put the assignment operator then the function directive, and then I tell it what arguments, what parameters it takes, x. And then anytime in these statements it sees x, it swaps that out for whatever got passed in. So this is a full definition of the squarer function. And then if I use this object, this function object I've defined, and pass in this parameter of 2, uh, then it returns this result. So a function returns a single object. In this case, this returns a numeric vector of length 1, and it expects numeric information to come in. Obviously, if we, uh, if we send in other uh, types of data structures other than just a numeric vector of length 1, um, then this, this wouldn't make sense. This, this would be an error in the code here. Um, you know, if I passed in a, a, a character string, um, it would try and multiply a character string and just throw an error. So obviously you have to know what, what you want to pass in and what a re function is, is, is supposed to return back. 
Okay, here we can see what it's supposed to return back. Um, and so if I do square with the number 2, square with the number 4, or I can take and assign the results of squaring 10 to y. So um, what actions are performed here? And I just wrote wrote here in these notes. So this, this returns 4, obviously, uh, returns 16. And then this one just assigns the value 100 to a new object called y. So just a numeric vector of length 1 now exists called y. Um, and it has a value of 100 assigned to it. OK, so um, we can also um, apply a function inside of a function. OK, so um, or take a take a function um, as a an argument to a function. So here I named it apply function. OK, so this is my new function. I'm going to call it apply function. It's going to apply a function. Um, again, this is a, for demonstration purposes. This, this, as you can see, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to make one just like this. Um, assignment operator, function directive. And then it takes in an x and an f. OK, so separated by a comma. That's how we separate our, uh, our parameters, an x and an f. Curly bracket, and then f of x is what it performs. And then, and then, the, and so, if we have a numeric vector um, with the values called numbers here, with the values 10, 20, and 30, then I can say apply function numbers. And so numbers is a vector of 10, 20, 30. That's my x. Ends up right here um, in the code. And then I want it. Th to apply the sum function. So sum is my f. So it's taking the sum of the numbers. OK, and then same down here with the mean. And then what happens? So this prints 60, and this returns or prints 20. OK? Uh, so what we saw here is this is called calling a function. Okay, actually using it, calling a function, uh, where we fill out the parameters uh, that the function has. Um, and then we pass the parameters into the function. And we already talked about there are different parameters types. So they're expecting a certain object class, you know, numeric uh, character function. You know, obviously, if we, if, if instead of sum, which is a, it's just a function, right, that's already defined. So this is a predefined function in R. It's not one that we're making custom here. It's it's already there. Mean is already there. A lot of functions are already there. This is just us defining a new function that'll be there that we can use just like a function that ex already exists. Okay. Um, but obviously, if I didn't pass sum in here, or mean, you know, I didn't pass an actual function in. I just passed like a a vector. Then it would just have a vector parentheses a vector, um, and and this wouldn't make sense to it. Okay, so it wouldn't um, it wouldn't work. So it expects certain um, certain classes of objects. Okay. Um, if you want to find information about a function that uh, either you've defined or is predefined, um, you know, for example, the sum function. If you want to find some information about that or um, any of the predefined functions in R. Uh, you can um, type the function name without any parentheses. Uh, just learn more about that object. Um, you can list the parameters using args for arguments of the function name. So that's just a function you can use, the args function, or the str, the structure function, to learn more about it. And then if you want a detailed documentation, you can just use the question mark function name. And then you can see the documentation to that, to that function. Um, now we'll talk about named versus positional calls. Um, so there are named calls that we can make using when we go to call a function. We can name the parameters specifically, or we can just have them in position. So in our example here, um, numbers followed by sum. So it knew numbers was the x 
and sum was the F. This is a positional call. The one before that, also positional, but there's only one position. Um, I could have also said in, inside the call, X equals 2 and named it specifically. Let me show you some examples here. So there's a function in R predefined uh, called runif, and that's the random uniform function. Um, and up here, in, I've just put the parameters that are available to runif. So the first one is n, comma, and then min equals 10, and then max equals 1. And so since these are already listed as min equals, uh, uh, I may have said that wrong, min equals 0 and max equals 1, um, since that's already listed here, um, these are called defaults. Okay, we'll talk about setting defaults here in a bit, but um, I can use these uh, these three parameters available to this function, in, min, and max, um, in whatever order I choose. And so um, all these functions below return 100 random uniform uh, values between negative 1 and 1. So I'm changing the min and max parameters. So I'm going to have min to negative 1 and max I'm going to set still just to 1 as it actually is in default. So here's a positional call. Um, I want 100. N is 100, so I want 100 random uniform values. I want the min, so that's the next one in position. Position 2, you know, so it's negative 1. Position 3 is 1. So this is this works just fine as I would as I'd want it to. Um, next one is a named call. Here I say n equals 100. So I'm saying I'm saying specifically n is 100. Min equals negative 1, max equals 1. So this is a named call, and it's all in the exact same order as a positional call. So that works fine, too. Um, and then I call this just a mixed call, where I don't define the first one with n equals. This is a really common way of doing it um, um, for some of these functions. So you just put 100. You know the first one's always n, you know, but maybe you can't remember the exact order of the other ones, so you could just put and define those with named calls. So min equals negative 1, max equals 1. Um, you can see here that it, these are actually all still in order. And then I, I call this like a confusing named call where maybe you didn't know the order and you just threw all the parameters out there. As long as you're doing a named call, you can do it in any order. Obviously, if, you're do, if you don't have the n equals min equals the actual name of the parameters, a named call, uh, then you're going to have issues. If the first parameter is in position, then then you start naming them, then it's going to say, well, you've already defined n. That's already been uh, tied to n. So then it, then it actually searches through and, and lets you define the rest of them. So you can mix them, okay, and it's kind of takes a little bit of thinking here to and maybe some practice to kind of uh, get down exactly how you can mix those. Um, I'll give you the exact rules uh, here in the slides, but um, um, there's a, you know, if you don't know at all the order or anything like that, or don't want to um, have it dependent on the order, um, then you can just put a named call. So, you know, if I put the max first, max equals 1, n equals 100, min equals negative 1, that works fine as well, because they're all named, so they all just one at a time. This assigns the max value, the n, the min. Okay? Um... Okay, so let's talk about uh, partial parameter name matching. So function parameters can be uh, partially matched as well. Um, this means that the only part of the parameter's name um, was used in the function. Um, there's an order of parameter matching. I'm going to show you some examples here, so I'm kind of going quick through this a little bit. But um, first, if you use the exact parameter name match, um, um, Next, the partial parameter name matching, and then the positional parameter name matching. This is the order that they will be uh, matched in the function. So let me, the examples are going to make that way easier. Okay, so um, this example kind of demonstrates every different way you could uh, look at positional named and partial matching. Okay, um, so I have a function called exponentiate. Ways to do this, in fact, I just use the caret operator here to exponentiate. Uh, some base number to some power. But I'm just going to make it into a function for demonstration purposes. 
okay so um, the exponentiate function is going to take in uh, two arguments um, base and power so I just named those base and power I, didn't, I don't have to use short little names like X and stuff like that I can use longer names um, and then uh, the code that runs is just going to take whatever is passed in for base and raise it to whatever power okay um, so all these calls below are actually equivalent so I can say 2 3 so that would be 2 to the third power I can say base equals 2 comma power equals 3 okay so that's a long way of doing it that's the named call I can say power equals 3 and so now there's just one parameter left to be defined so power is assigned a value and then there's just one left on the list so whatever comes next it's going to assume okay that's the base you want or I can just say 2 as my base and then it says okay it assigns that to the first one since I didn't have a named piece here and then I go and I assign specifically power equals 3 and then here's the partial matching I was talking about so just say B equals 2 <laughs> so it's just part of the name and it's gonna say well I don't see anything else that starts with a B so I guess you're saying base equals 2 power equals 3 and then similar to this example here um, P equals 3 so it goes and says what are they talking about oh power okay power equals 3 and then 2 they're saying okay well there's just one left to be defined so he's defining the base now so we had we used positional matching named matching named followed by positional named then positional again um, um, actually this one should be positional then named this one's positional then named and then um, um, partial name matching and then partial followed by positional okay so um, if you kind of understand this piece right here then you understand all these little subtle nuances um, um, to the named and positional um, and partial uh, matching of uh, or passing arguments to a function <coughs> so now we'll talk about uh, default values um, let me just hop uh, hop to an example here so we said that uh, our unif has uh, default values of 0 and 1 so if we just said 200 here it would match to n and then it would go okay then min is 0 max is 1 so that there's a default value there already so we could use positional where we label all of them this is just positional using defaults and we can also use and do a named call n equals 200 and leave the other ones you know blank and then that uses the defaults so whenever a function is written in a way that it has this equal sign here then it uses those default values if it doesn't find any that the user pass to it obviously n doesn't have a default so if I don't define n you know if I just said our unif min equals zero and didn't put an n parameter in there uh, named or positionally then that would be an error you know you need n to be defined for it to run um, so here's an example of, of some default values again a really basic uh, example here that you wouldn't actually write it this way but it's the easiest way to learn um, how the function directive itself works how to define functions uh, using defaults so uh, add to it just adds two numbers so I call this function add to function and it takes X and Y and if it doesn't get any information about what what you want X and Y to be then it's just going to use 10 as a default um, so then it just adds X and Y and so add to 2 comma 2 what gets performed there um, what if we just put 2 and what if we put nothing so 2 and 2 would just say X is 2 Y is 2 add those together return 4 uh, add 2 if we just give it 2 then it matches the first position to 2 so it says X is 2 Y it didn't we didn't give it a Y so it uses 10 so 2 and 10 is 12 if we don't give it any uh, parameters at all that's okay because all the parameters have default values so it's like okay you called this function um, all right just using defaults 10 and 10 20 okay didn't you didn't override the defaults here 
in this one. Here you just kind of overrid one of the defaults. Um, there's also this idea of lazy execution. So um, there's this is a very simple example. Um, so we had that square function. We have x, y, and z. Um, so say y and z aren't used. Only x is used. Um, so it only uses that. It doesn't actually give you an error. Um, this is a contrived example here, as all of them have been. Um, but actually, if you had uh, some conditional execution in your function where there was if statements and things like that, um, then uh, this would then uh, be a more valuable uh, um, concept, I guess. That's when this kind of comes in, the, this lazy execution that, that our functions exhibit. Um, where if, if, if some of the parameters you passed in weren't needed for whatever reason, um, based on, again, some if statements that didn't get tripped, um, if you could think of it that way, then it, if it didn't need them to execute, then it just doesn't use them and it doesn't it doesn't worry about it. So if we said square 2, then the first one is 2. The other two don't have values assigned to them, but as it goes through and uses x, it uses x again, and then it just never had to search the namespace of the function for y and z parameters, so it doesn't care, it just executes. Um, if I defined x, y, and z to be 2, 100 and 300, um, as you can see here, it also just returns 4. So 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 2 is 4. So this just assigns x, y, and z inside the function only. This assigns them values. It's just like assigning a value out in what's called the global environment that we've been doing. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, it, it just assigns like an x, y, and a z, and then it uses x. And so it doesn't it was never asked to use these other ones, so there's no errors. It's it's a lazy execution, meaning it only uses what it needs and doesn't throw errors. So that's actually a nice thing that, that it does. Um, there's also, you also see some um, um, functions that utilize unspecified number of parameters. So if you look at the sum function, um, like here's it. I'll just go right to this slide. So the parameters of the sum function, if you take a look at those, it's actually, it says dot, 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 comma, n a remove equals false. So it's got an unspecified infinite number of parameters you know you could put here because you could sum up any number of elements. So I had that add to function with where it added x to y. And then you'd have to just go through and say what, you know, x1, x2, x3, x4, x, y, z, and just keep running through letters. Um, now, the, it, you'd want to be able to sum any number of elements. So if I put sum 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, it just keeps assigning those in this space unless you do a named call to get and use the na remove. Um, what this does is it removes missing values, true or false. By default, it doesn't. So that's by default, that's false. Um, so I'm just going to show you how like a simple function here that has this unspecified number of parameters, uh, which is denoted as dot, dot, dot. Um, and then, you, you know, you have to use a named call, obviously, to use this because uh, the position doesn't is always different. So this always has to be a named call um, if you have this dot, dot, dot. So you can say 2, 2, 2, do 2, and that returns 10. Uh, so it just sums those up. You can say sum... 10 and 20 and say na remove is false which is the default anyways um, that returns 30 10 and 20 is 30 uh, then since it's a named call I can use it first so I can say sum any remove equals true 10 10 and so these just keep going to that dot 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 <laughs> place there you know that unspecified list that where it's going to sum all these elements and that returns 30 but if I try a positional call you know, like I put t, I don't do a named call of na.remove equals t. Um, for one thing, I'm in the wrong order here. You know, it should be last in the list, but even if it was last, it wouldn't know if it was like the third element of something you were trying to sum up. And so if you remember, true and false are actually stored as 1 and 0 um, in memory. So it actually takes a t to be 1, 10, and 20. So I have to use the name call always 
no matter where this t is in this list, I have to use a name call when I have unspecified parameters. This returns 31, which you may not be, you know, expecting, or you may be expecting. I don't, depending on your use. So, a one t one 10 and 20 is 31. Uh, the returned object of a function. So uh, every function call returns a single object or no objects at all. Um, so what do I mean by that? So um, you know the very last thing. Let me go to our other examples. So for squarer here, the very last statement performed by default, I would just say this gets returned. So this returns a four. So when I enter this function, it's a four. I can also use the assignment operator to assign, you know, say, um, um, you know, y assignment operator square -er function call two, and then I would assign y the value of four. Okay, so um, I'm it's just returning a number. Now, to be explicit, I can use the return function. So if I say um, function return x so I have a function that's called times 2 it takes in an x I say return x and then I assign y the value of x times 2 and I start, say return y um, this would be kind of a this is for demonstration purposes of what would happen if you had multiple tried to return multiple things um, and then I call it with a 10 so 10 comes in I tell it to return 10 then I tell it to assign y the value of 10 times 2, 20. And then I say return 20. So I tell it return 10, do this, and return 20, essentially. And here I assign v uh, to that result as well. So as a demonstration, this actually returns 10 because I told it explicitly to return here. So this, all this following code here, it doesn't really matter. Um, so you wouldn't want to use your return function it wouldn't make sense to use it twice. It's just going to return automatically. Then it's going to say, okay, I already did my job as a function because I just return one thing. I can't just return 10 and 20. Now, if I wanted to um, combine together a vector of length 2, 10 and 20 in the code, uh, I could do that. Um, but that's not what I did here. I returned something. I defined something else, and I tried to return that as well. That doesn't work. So it just returns 10. Um, and then here, if I use the print function instead, I just want to show you some of these nuances. Um, it actually prints 10 and prints 20. So it prints two different things here. Um, but the function just returns. Um, so it just prints it right there to the console. But a function only returns one value. So if I was to assign v the value of uh, times 2, the parameter set to 10, it would print 10, print 20 to the console, but then v would be the assigned the value of 20, the last thing that it printed. So um, I'm kind of showing you some warnings here of messing around with the return and print functions, explicit return, explicit print functions. Um, so this actually does something different. This goes and assigns the last thing that was printed. Okay. Um, and then there's this idea of implicit printing. So that was explicit printing, and now we can use implicit printing, where I just say x, so that just prints my 10. Then I assign y, uh, that'll be assigned to 20 in this case. And then I just say y, which is telling it implicitly to print. Um, so here it returns or prints only 20. And in the next one, v is assigned the value of 20 and nothing is printed. So if I'm implicitly telling it to print, it's basically like the last thing that was told to implicitly print prints. Okay, so if you understand the um, these examples here, they're all just contrived examples, right? Just, you know, just very much things you wouldn't do normally, but it just is the bare minimum amount of code uh, that I thought I needed to demonstrate these concepts to you. So um, note here that the, whatever the last thing is you told to print basically implicitly is what it returns. And if you remember before, 
like for this function, for square error, this is an, an implicit print right here, x times x. I'm not assigning a value or anything like that. So this is a, a line that gets executed as a single line. So that's, that's an implied printing here, OK? And so that's what's returned from that function. Um, what's returned? By what's returned, I just mean what comes back. If you were to assign, assign a value using that function, what it actually kicks back. Um, if you want to return multiple objects, the easiest way to do that is stick them into a list. You know, I said if you wanted to return multiple numbers, you could stick them in a vector. But if you wanted to return multiple objects of, of different classes and things like that, remember a list can take, a list is an object that can take any other um, objects and, and return them. So you could have the first element of your list could be a whole complete data frame. The next one could be another list. The next one could be a vector. The next one could be... Um, you know something else so you could just keep returning um, you kind of wrapping all of these into a single object let me show you what that looks like so call the function sum stats and that's a function of X and so you you give it X and then it returns a single object so this is a single basically a single implicit print statement you could think about it that way where it's a list object starting here ending here and the first one is called mean and that equals the mean of x and then there's a comma the next element in the list is variance that equals a variance of x comma next one's called range and that is I use the combined function min x comma max x so this is a vector of length 2 and I end that and then the total is the sum of x and then the function, that's the function definition. So um, this takes in um, numeric vectors is what this is expecting, okay? So I have something called numbers, and that's, I use R norm, where it just uses a normal distribution, uh, randomly selects from a normal distribution, 100 observations. And um, then I just define something stats list, and I just call the sum stats function and I pass in those 100 numbers, okay? And so it goes and it finds the mean, variance, minimum, max, and sum of these 100 numbers that I created here. And so if I then print stats list, or I just type stats list, hit enter into my console, for example, um, to implicitly print stats list, then it says, okay, you have the first element is called mean, and that is a numeric vector of length one. That's the mean. Okay, um, the variance is here, uh, range is a, a vector of length 2, so this is the smallest we saw, this is the largest we saw. And actually, I should tell you something, that the mean is um, expected to be 0, so if we sample random numbers around 0, this is, you know, we expect this to be uh, about right. The variance expectation is 1, so this is actually not too far off. Um, the range, the smallest number and the largest number around that 0 at this variance um, end up being negative 2.61 and then 2.11. So pretty symmetrical range, you know, uh, around uh, the point of 0. So that's this also makes sense. Um, so again, just kind of talking about what we expected from the R norm function. And then the total, if you added all the numbers up, it'd be negative 14. Okay. Um, here I use another example of returning um, uh, multiple objects. So um, I'll let you kind of take a look at that. So, um, well, this is a, this is an example using the split function, which already is defined in R. Um, splits a data frame uh, by a column and returns a single list object with multiple data frames. Um, I'll let you take a look at that uh, if you like. Okay, symbol binding and scoping rules. Um, so what is symbol binding? Um, actually, this is just what we've been doing when we assign uh, like the symbol x uh, to a vector 1 and 2 you know, the range 1 to 2, so 1 and 2, the values 1 and 2, gets bound to the symbol x. That's symbol binding. 
That's you know another simple example here. Um, here's simple binding. Um, let's make a function called sum, and it's a function x takes x and y and it multiplies them together. Um, okay, so this isn't what we expect. What I'm showing you here is an example of if you use an existing function name. So R already has a function called sum. What if I just took sum and said, no, I want sum to multiply two numbers together. Um, obviously not what the user may be expecting, but um, you know you can run into this problem pretty easily where you have multiple names for a same function and multiple symbols, like the symbol sum, bound to the same um, object, such as the fu a function. Okay. So if I actually um, take this sum function and I put 10 and 20, um, then it returns 200, you know, and that's exactly what I told the function to do. And, but then if I use the remove function and remove sum from my environment, so this is just if I run this, this code here, and then I run this code, and then I run this code, and I remove sum, then it drops it from the environment. And then I run sum 10 and 20 again, it returns 30. So I dropped my, my sum object from the environment. Um, let's see. Let me show the scoping rules and symbol binding. So just in general, um, we have different environments, and so what we can see here, we have a global environment, okay? Um, you have in the global environment. Say I assign um, if, uh, A to old, and uh, then I make something called test, and that is a function with no parameters, where it just takes A and assigns it a value new using um, this type of an assignment operator where I have uh, kind of two arrows on it. This is what you need to assign to a parent environment. So if I was um, to run old here and then run test or define test as uh, what assigns a a value of new, and then I look at a. So let me return. Old. Then if I call that function called test, and then I run a again, now a returns new. So if I use this type of assignment operator, this will return. Um, this will then assign to the parent environment of the function. So here's the function in this environment returning to the parent environment. Let me drop one of these arrows and run this again. So if I run A, it returns old. I run the test function, and then I run A again, and it, why didn't it assign A this value of new? Well, it's just doing that inside the functions environment, right? You could think of it inside these brackets, right? I didn't define it inside brackets. You can do that. You, know, you can even do it, right? We did it on multiple lines. So think of this, this inside these brackets is the environment for this function. And so up here we have what's called the global environment. So in the global environment, I define A as old. Here inside the function I assign, I assign A to be new. So I print what A is, I call the function, so it assigns A to new only inside the test environment. Okay the test functions environment. So here it didn't do anything. But I can use something called a, well, I can use basically what's called the, the parent environment assignment. Okay, so now what this does is it assigns up one level. So the level that the function is defined, it assigns a up to the global environment now. A is old. I run the function. I, I run a again and it prints new. So this is how you can define, assign to what's called the parent environment. So there's a functions environment, there's a parent environment. That's the environment that the function was defined in. Okay. 
Um, here is another example where we have B. Say B is assigned to uh, old. Okay, and then I have a function test. Inside of test, I <laughs> define another function called test2, the value of new. And then my function returns B. My test function returns B after it's been assigned. So let's think through this. So I have B says old. I run the test function, and it returns old. Okay, so inside of the test 2, it took B and assigned to the parent environment, or the enclosing environment, the value of new. And so actually inside of test, now B is new. But that's just going up one level. It would need to go up two levels. You know, so what do we do? Do we go, well, I'll just add <laughs> another one of these arrows? Um, no, actually, the easiest way to do that is to use um, the assigned function. Okay, so we have A is set to old, and then we can have a function where, you know, and here I'll maybe make it easier if I put it inside of square brackets. Easier to see kind of the environment. So we have A assigned to old. So it returns old, it's a character vector of length one. And then I have test. And then test uses the assign function. It assigns A, a value of new, in the environment equals global environment. Okay, our global environment. What's out here? This is our global environment where A is. And then I run A, I test, and then I run A. Um, oops. I got an error here. I didn't put a curly bracket in there at some point. Okay, so I run A, old, I run test, and now A is new. So this assign function is how you can directly assign things to what's called the global environment. Um, and then there's a more detailed demonstration here in the, uh, the demo with the scoping rules. Um, um, just a brief overview. Um, of assigning to the parent environment with the double arrow or inside the function or the child environment or <laughs> whatever you want to call that um, and then here's how you assign from local or inside of a function locally to globally using the assign function uh, next we're going to talk about defining and calling infix functions um, there's special type of functions that create essentially custom operators. It just changes where the parameters are at when we call them, essentially. So as a review, here are the mathematical operators available in R. So you know you can add things together, subtract things. So you know you can add things together, or you can use the sum function, right? So addition operator. Um, then there are logical operators in R. Well, we can actually make our own operators um, function. Uh, so we define uh, quote marks here, put our function name, put our parameters as we did before, and our statements as we did before. So the different put a's uh, inside of quote mark, quote marks here. And then when we go to call it, we actually put our parameter values outside with the symbol in between. Okay, let me show you what this looks like. So we have the adder function. It takes a and b and it adds them together. Okay, so this is... Uh, uh, you know, a would be like a sum function, you know, so adder takes 10 and 11 and it returns 21, okay? Um, we could also make a symbol um, between percentage signs. I don't think I said that part. Yeah, I didn't say that part, but, um, you know, you have percentage signs and quote marks, okay? So that's how it knows what you're doing. So quote mark, percentage sign, and then I put some whatever symbol I'd like to choose, percentage sign, quote mark, and then it takes in A and B and adds them together. And then when I go to call an infix function, I take 10, my symbol with the percentage signs but without the quote marks, and then 11, and this returns 21. Okay, so look, I can nest them inside of parentheses with the name of the function out here, or I can have a symbol and where an object to the left and the right, um, 
is is operated on by this symbol. Okay, so my A parameter is 10, my B parameter is 11. So this is a custom operator that you can make. So here's another example. Um, we're going to make a concatenation operator. Concatenation just means taking two character strings and pasting them together. Uh, in our case, two character vectors of length one, uh, also called character string. Um, and there's a function that does this in R called paste and paste O. Uh, paste O returns, uh, you know, A and B in this case, or or whatever arguments you give it. Uh, in a list form, you know, just whatever arguments, well, not a list object, but just listed in the parameters of the function. Um, you know, whatever you get, it, it just re sticks them all together without any spaces in between. So it's kind of like paste with zero spacing. <laughs> and then there's the paste function that puts a space between. Um, so I'm going to use both of these. So I'm going to call this just a plus sign between percentages signs, and that's going to be my function that takes in some a and b and it applies the paste o function to a and b. And so my a is high, my plus sign there, and it returns high there. So there's zero space when you run this function. Um, and if I just denoted that you know this is the one that uses a space, so it adds them together and puts a space. So this was the symbol I chose for this function, uh, this infix function that utilizes the, the standard function in R called paste. And so it takes an A high, my operator there, and it returns high there. So if I wanted to, instead of using the paste function, for example, I could make an operator out of it and you know, just take an A and a B on either side of it. Or you could call this an X and a Y or, or whatever. I'm just using A and B for these infix operators. Um, here's another example. So here I just want to test if two numbers are equal. So remember we have the, uh, if we use two equal signs, so I say 10 equal sign equal sign 10, then it's testing um, is 10 equal or equivalent to 10. Um, is it the same value? And so this returns a logical vector of length 1, meaning it just returns a, a value true. It just says true. Um, but I want to make an operator that says, returns a character vector of length one that says equal or it says not equal. So it returns uh, one of those two character vectors. So here I have a, I'm just going to use an underscore to denote this. Um, so it takes A and B and it uses the if statement. We're going to talk about uh, this more uh, two weeks from now. Um, so if a is equivalent to B, so if this value is true, then it returns equal, otherwise it returns not equal. And so 10 and 10 returns true, if I use my new operator, then it says equal. So um, if I use 10 and 11, it returns false, if I use my new operator, it says not equal. Okay, and there's some examples of this um, in the in the demo on infix functions. So I have my my high there example. So it returns high there. Um, I have this example. So this is available on Blackboard. So this is true. This is equal. False, not equal. Okay. Um, and that's it for infix functions. Now we're going to talk about um, using functionals. Um, a functional uh, technically is any function that takes a function as a parameter. Um, we're going to talk about a special group of functionals known as the apply functionals or here it says star apply. So it's the apply family of functionals. Some uh, Sometimes there's like a t apply or an s apply. So there's you know uh, a letter in front of this that's it's kind of like a wild card here. So there's some letter in front of uh, the word apply for most of these in this this family um, of functionals that are predefined in R. Okay. Um, so there's apply. It fly, applies functions over array margins. 
there's by that applies a function to data frames split by factors. There's e apply, l apply, r apply, t apply, m apply. Um, um, that you can see, you know, a list of some of those here. Um, the wording's kind of confusing on these. Uh, let's just look at examples. Okay, and these are like the most useful examples um, um, that we'll need in this class. So, um, l apply, if we'll read the definition, apply a function over a list or vector. So, if I have l apply, and I take in, if you remember the iris data set, I just want the first through fourth columns. So this is a list, a data frame is, this is a subset of a data frame, which is a data frame. Data frames are special types of lists. So this is a list containing four columns, and I want to take the mean. And so what it does is it goes through and it takes and returns the first column's name, or the first element in the list, um, and it gives the next column's name the mean, the next column's name the mean. So this is a pretty useful way of of getting the mean of all of your, these are all the numeric columns, for example, in the iris data set, um, or iris data frame. Um, and then I can use s apply, which is just a special type of l apply. So remember I said l apply has many different versions, and you don't see s apply on this list. Um, so s apply is just a special kind of l apply. It just returns these in a different format. See how this is, instead of returning a list, it returns this type of a format here. Um, so you may find this more visually appealing or maybe um, um, better for whatever analytical process you're working on to return this type of uh, this type of a, a structure here. Okay. As opposed to this is a list. Um, and this I think technically is a data frame. So remember, iris Oh look, there's some information. Um, famous data set that gives measurements in centimeters of variable, variable various flowers. okay and the iris um, names, iris. So, this returns the names of the iris data set of uh, the column names. So if I pedal this function on the first four, you can see here the first four columns. Okay. Um, there's also the by and the t apply functionals. Um, so by uh, is able to split up by a factor. And so you can see by applies a function uh, to a data frame split by factors. So by takes in just a single column in iris, iris petal length, and then using species, it splits up based on species, so setosa, versicolor, virginica are the species. So for each unique value of species it finds, it groups those up and returns the mean value of petal length. So the mean petal length for setosa flower, so it says iris species setosa, is 1.4, there's the mean for versicolor, there's the mean for virginica. So a really useful way of splitting up now uh, your data. So you can get, uh, here we got the mean of all the columns, and here we're getting a mean within a column um, using another column to split it up. Okay, so using a, a character column to split it up. Um, and then t apply returns a slightly different um, version than the by function. So again, um, here we're returning, I believe, a data frame using t apply. Uh, so we just have a nice, neat little data frame. Uh, petal length, species, mean. Um, you can see it's all written the same way as the by function, but returning a different, uh, different look, a different object, uh, same values. Um, and here, fun is a parameter. That's a named parameter call. It stands for function. So here I'm saying the function you want to use is mean. Here I did a positional call. I just put mean. So instead of fun equals mean, I just put mean. So uh, these are all positional calls here. The, I want this this column. Okay, so this is a, uh, since I'm just doing a single column, this is actually a uh, numeric vector in the first argument. Um, 
a character vector in the next argument that it's going to split things up by, um, and then a function um, being passed as the, the last argument to the t apply function.